Okay, welcome back for another episode of the podcast. And you can also see the video recording on YouTube. Uh, I am back with Zach Carter, and we are going to talk about signs of porn addiction. And basically, like, you know, in the last time we talked, we said this is an elusive and an insidious, I call it an insidious journey where your brain's kind of being hijacked by porn use. And there's a continuum of use to misuse, to abuse, to compulsion, to addiction. And if you consume porn for any amount of time with consistency, frequency, and especially with increasing intensity, you will go along this continuum of use, misuse, abuse, compulsion, addiction. And we're going to break that down a little bit, but I just wanted to start with a quick story of my first client. I told you how I've been uh, in the midst of getting this into a book and thinking about that first client some of the experiences that I had, and hopefully Zach will talk about his own experience in a second, but I didn't like to use the word addiction because I was really hesitant for like a a while, a year or two probably, which is a long while, because even in my mind, I'm like, I know this is a compulsion. So in the ICD-11, it's called hypersexual behavior disorder, and it's a compulsive, hypersexual compulsive behavior disorder. It's considered, you know, classified in a mental health challenge. It'll, you know, I don't like the word, any of these words, but, you know, as a disorder in terms of compulsion. So I'm like, yeah, I can wrap my mind around compulsion. People have obsessive thoughts or feelings, which leads them towards compulsive behavior. So I could stay there. In a lot of the literature, it's called problematic porn use. So, you know, I'm like, okay, but that's a mouthful. <laughs> but at the same time, like, you know, I think in every person's journey, there's a moment when they can feel that it's an addiction. And I'd like to break that down. And that occurred to me, and I can tell you more in a minute how that occurred to me in my journey, where I'm like, yeah, this is a full-blown addiction and I'm okay using this word now forever. And I don't care if people agree with me or not or understand or don't, because unless you hit that moment, you don't know. But when you hit that moment, you do. And I guess we'll leave it at that. Can I interrupt for two seconds right before yep. you start your story? Yeah. It's also it's also not a sex addiction. It's a pornography addiction because it can decrease your desire to have porn with actual or to have sex with actual partners. And so some people want to use the terms interchangeably, but it's it's not a sex addiction. It's a pornography addiction because you can be a virgin watching pornography, but um, you, but there are people that are actually hooked on having sex with lots of different people. That's a sex totally. addiction. Yeah. So right? yeah, I, yeah. And I'll expand on that if you're okay with it, because that mm-hmm. is a great, thank you for making that disti- distinction. Be- so in ICD-11, ICD is the international classification of diseases. So that's a way that we classify things that are happening to people in terms of their health. In there, it is classified as compulsive sexual behavior disorder, but the number one way that that manifests is in pornography consumption. So what's happening to so many people and especially younger people is they don't have the desire to be with other people because they have linked and coupled their brain neurologically to the screen and they're getting all the dopamine from the screen. So it's a really great distinction. But if you're out there and you're like, I totally think about having sex with a lot of people all the time, you can also have hypersexual behavior disorder manifest in all different kinds of ways. And Zach started to make that distinction. So, you know, there's people that I work with, I try not to say anything triggering. So I'm just going to tell you one or two things without giving you the gamut of things that are out there. Because I also know when I say things, I will get emails from people saying, I didn't know about that thing. And now my hijacker wants to know everything about it. And they, you know, Dr. Trish, you just gave me a new problem. So I definitely don't want to do that either, but you know, there's, tons of ways with real people in terms of infidelity, in terms of dating apps, in terms of hooking up with people, just objectifying women, staring at their body parts, particular body parts all the time. Then the internet has a wide and terrible array of ways that you can interact sexually with people. Mm. If that, you know, I know a lot of you out there are sucked into different things that your brain tells you it has to do all the time. A lot of those things are very expensive and you're spending a lot of money and it's serving your nervous system in a certain way, but that is a sex addiction. If you're doing those things with real people or 
other sexual acting out behaviors, either on the internet or by yourself or with other people. But then the number one way that it manifests is in pornography consumption, which can then go into directions, either you don't want to have sex with real human partners, or it sends your brain in this cheating infidelity hookup. So it, so again, this, there's like a big umbrella term that's covering all this stuff. So nothing but bad things is what it leads to. None of it's good. (laughs) Whether you're engaging it with other people or whether you're completely not engaging with anyone. (laughs) Totally. And, and, you know, that's exactly it because neurologically, you know, and if we're just going to talk brain stuff for a second, you don't want to couple your brain to a screen in your hand. What kind of sex life is that? Like, that's Mm. not what I want for you. You also don't want to couple your brain and have your brain need to I talked to a client of mine the other day who's unfortunately in a downward spiral. You know, I always say it's either an upward spiral or a downward spiral. He's currently a stressor kicked in, in a downward spiral, went on a dating app. You know, I don't even know how you use them. Thank God to, you know, had somebody come over and is having sex with a random person who starts to do some strange and weird things that he was not, didn't sign on for. I'm like, but if you use a dating app, who's on the other side of that? Not a healthy woman. So my point is your brain's been linked to that to call over unhealthy women to just use them for sex. I don't want that for you because your brain can be rewired so that healthy sexuality and healthy mood regulation are in place and you can build a beautiful relationship with connection that is also fun and engaging. Right. And that guy's also being used. So she, neither partner is interested in the depth, the character, the, the human being that they're with. It's you are an object that I'm going to use for my own pleasure. That's yeah, what you do this, with pornography, essentially. Totally. And, and what that girl was telling him was just to perpetuate her wounds. Like the way I think about all this stuff is we're wounded people. And then we try to fill our wounds. And when it comes to pornography, you're just trying to fill your wounds with what mm. porn gives you. It gives you dopamine in your brain and people use it for all different reasons. So it might make you feel in control of things you weren't in control of, or you're not in control of. It might make you feel desired. I was reading another article, which I'm going to make a video about in the future about what men really want out of a healthy sex life. Um, You know, and it says in there, which of course is a no brainer, but I like science behind it is that men want to feel desired. And when porn enters into it, it makes your sex life funky with your partner And it makes your partner not desire you because it got weird and it went south because you've been using her body as an object for your pleasure. Mm. That makes a woman not want to jump into that again when they can feel that. They might not even know you're using porn. They just know this is no longer about connection and Mm. and serotonin, the happiness or joy or oxytocin, Mm. the neurochemical for connection. It's about, you know, having not even an experience, a performance. So many times it makes men go into that performer role and they're doing a performance to kind Mm. of emulate what they've seen and, and, you know, perform what they think is a great sex experience, which actually isn't, but I'm on like nine tangents. Let's get back to. (laughs) Sure. Sure. Yeah. You had a story you wanted to tell before we got. I'm on so many tangents right now. (laughs) I started it seriously ridiculous so let's get back to because what we're supposed to be talking about are the signs of porn addiction and I actually was also making something for my website um trying to generalize for people and you know I always call it the screen so the screen covers porn social media because when people come off of porn and they promise herself they're not going to watch porn what they will do is get out the JC Penny catalog and do mm. what some of my clients call porn adjacent behaviors. And so like, if you're on social media and, you know, with using still images of people, or if you, you know, are, are getting those dopamine hits in different ways, then you're still kind of trapped in the screen. And so I have a, a porn addiction quiz or a, the screen addiction quiz, which kind of encapsulates, you know, do you think about the screen? whatever thing you're doing. Do you think about it? Does it take up your time and your energy? Does it take up your money? If you, have you ever tried to quit and ha- haven't been very successful when you tried to quit? Have you experienced some types of withdrawal types of symptoms? These are the classic things. Have you lied about using the screen or the amount of time that you use the screen to somebody? Does using the screen interfere with your work, your school, or your relationships? If it does, do you keep going back into the screen and that's, that's based on the problematic porn use scale. And I'm forgetting one I can look. I can, actually have it up I, on my screen. Mm-hmm, while you're jump looking in. it up? Yeah, let me mm-hmm. jump in just real quick. 
What I don't want people to hear is that, oh, it doesn't impact my work, therefore I don't have a problem. The way that psychological tests work is that it's something like zero to two of these. You it's have one, mile. it's actually one. So it's really? one. If you oh, answered okay. yes to one of those, because they took the large scale, and this has been tested by, um, if for porn, it's been tested. They made it into, there's a large assessment. They made it into a short scale mm. of just these questions. And if you answer one, you likely have a problem. And I've put this, there's a video on my YouTube channel. There's a few, there's at least two videos about this. So you can search um, you know, porn addiction quiz on my channel and you'll see that video because underneath it, people put in the comments, you know, like, dang, I, I've got six of them. I'm in real right. trouble. And yeah. most people, right. you know, if you do watch porn, the, the moral of that story is if you watch porn, likely you've answered one. And if you've watched frequently, consistently, and with any level of intensity, you've probably answered yes to all of them. Yeah. So your point's well taken is that mm -hmm. it doesn't have to interrupt your work. So many people that I work with, and this will get back to the insidious nature, it mm -hmm. creeps in when you're not looking. So mm -hmm. many people think it makes their work better mm -hmm. initially. I don't know if you had that experience because they feel more focused because they need the dopamine. So until the scales kind of tip, they're getting the dopamine to offset the deficit that's been created in their life. And especially it's like, it's kind of at this point where a person really does tip from like, Casual use is the wrong way of saying it, but less frequent use. Yeah. And when it becomes more frequent and consistent, they're getting so much more dopamine and they're not having like those lulls, hmm. but that could only sustain for a little while. And then it tips into brain fog and malfunction and right. depression. But when people are kind of riding that, they feel like it's really helping them to perform, but they don't understand. It's like, you know, you've maxed out your drug addiction and you're hmm. in this like wild ride of cranking things out, right. but you're about to crash. Well, yeah, and I can't, I can't think of like instances where I wouldn't, have, I just wouldn't have noticed it because I was doing it so consistently that that was my normal brain functioning. And so I wouldn't have been able to tell the difference between me doing it and me not doing it because my brain was already so fried. So let me ask you, how did you know, like, did you have a moment when you, when you're like, this is a problem? Well, so for me, and, and I know this isn't the case for everybody because different people have different upbringings because I had a more religious background or more religious upbringing and I was told, hey, lusting is wrong. Um, I, I always felt bad about it. And so I probably would have categor categorized towards the beginning, oh yeah, I'm addicted when maybe I wouldn't have been, but eventually it, it became an addiction for sure. And mm -hmm, I, I think the times where I freaked myself out was when it increased in intensity and watching things that I found morally repulsive. Mm -hmm. And to this day, if I, if someone found out about what I was watching, I would be horrified. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I think that's when I knew that it was like, this is, this is a big problem for sure. And that was, how did you deal with it in those days before you told your friend? Um, I assume it creates, you know, creates so much shame for people. People don't right. understand. They do have a lot of shame. Well, I guess I have two questions. How'd you deal with it? And did it show mm. up in your behaviors? Because typically the shame mm. will show up in people's behaviors as irritability, more anger. It's like projection, big time projection is mm. what of the people, you know, close to me that have sure. struggled with this, that they project out and think everybody's attacking them because they feel like they've attacked their true self, you know? And shame can really play yeah. out in strange ways. I, I think one thing that I noticed, and I was always con I was always confused by, and it's not a problem now, but I had a hard time looking my mom in the eye regularly, mm. and mm. and I would have to kind of force myself to do it. And I think it was tied to the shame. And then, Definitely. like now, that's not a thing. Like I'm perfectly happy to look her in the that eye. That happens to so many people. In. Somebody put a comment on my channel yesterday saying. You know, I've really been sucked in hard time, hardcore lately, and mm. I can't look people in the eyes. Does that have right. anything to do with my frontal lobe functioning? I think mm. they even said frontal lobe because it was on a, one of the videos about the neuroscience. And um, it does. And your frontal lobe, when it slows down, like it's, it, we talk about shame, that's the behavioral correlate, the emotional correlate of that brain performance pattern. So your brain slows down, it goes low in 
energy, basically. It's low and slow, and it's peppered with anxiety, and that impacts your frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe, there's lots of studies, a couple cool ones, are, is the, the area for socialization and kind of like the way that, that your self-esteem and your self-worth plays out in socialization. And so when it's impacted, it makes eye contact and approaching people and engaging with life very difficult. Mm. Right. And so something, so I, I haven't done a lot of dating in my life. My personal philosophy has always been like, I see dating more as a courtship. So I'm, I'm dating a person who I am seeing if they're potential for marriage. Not everybody looks at it that way. It's just the way I look at it. And so I only really had two serious relationships in my life. But one of the problems, because I was regularly, regularly looking at porn in my first relationship was the woman that I was dating, I was just fixated on her flaws, just completely fixated. And classic, uh, yes. classic. <laughs> and it just, I couldn't, in, in, in the group I attend, there's a guy that's, a, that's this, the same way. He's engaged to this woman and he's like, I think she's beautiful, but she doesn't have a big this or a big that yeah. or whatever. And like, I was fixated and it wrecked that relationship. And I'm fortunate that I met a woman that's beautiful, that I love, that I'm meant to be with. But in that, at that time, you know, I, I wrecked it. And I know there's a lot of guys out there that are in a relationship with someone who's awesome, that's beautiful. They wreck it. And then the rest of their life, they look back and they're like, how could I have jacked that up? And it's because you're not thinking right, dude. Yeah. Your, your brain is jacked up from pornography. And no matter what she looked like, whatever idealized version you have, it wouldn't have mattered because there's only one of her. You, you need more. You need mm -hmm. different, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's what porn does to you. And so I think that's another way that it- Totally, it really distorts the whole thought system and it makes people go dark side, like I'll say. Mm. And it really does. And I've talked to so many people, it breaks my heart, you know, mm. that go, I let the one slip away because, mm. you know, uh, one guy told his wife, you know, they've been married for 20 years or something and told his wife that, you know, for the first, when he, when he left porn for the first time ever, he was looking at her without, you know, wanting her to look different or better, yeah. which of course he thought was a compliment. His wife wasn't, a f <laughs> that's like, yeah. you're telling me for the last 19 years, you've been looking at me thinking you wanted more, but how can you not when, like you said, there's right. no way. And I know women, when they hear me talk, because some women listen to this podcast, that upsets them. But the point is, it porn's a super normal stimulus. Like, right. it actually doesn't even matter what the person looks like. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, as a woman, you go, oh, like, oh, if I only looked like that person, right. it's not. It's the fact that porn in and of itself is a super normal stimulus. And it is giving, you know, your brain dopamine deluge, that flood and that's linking you to thinking that that is the highest level of stimulus for arousal. That's why it's different for all people what the thing is, because it's not like there's a right. standard for that. It's just what your brain has gotten. But then you can't get that from your partner. So you see the flaws because your partner becomes a dopamine deficit. And yeah. you look at your partner like, where's the dopamine hits when I look at you? They're missing. Right. But if you stop watching porn and you, you stabilize and heal your brain mm -hmm. and you change that homeostasis. And I've talked about this, not a lot lately, but what happens is when you were young and the first time you saw porn, your brain actually had to change the way it was developing. And now it needs twice as much dopamine as it would if it never saw porn. And right. so porn becomes the thing with the two times or more dopamine and re your real partner is lacking that. So you exactly. just, so when you come out of it, it stabilizes and you can get back to getting the dopamine from your partner. Yeah, you know, and I, I heard a comedian once say, if women want to know why is it that men are always trying to look at so many different women, he's like, why do you need so many pairs of shoes in your closet? It's like, why do you need 100 pairs of shoes? What's the point? It's like, well, because I like lots of different shoes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like, exactly. well, you know, and that's not, that doesn't comfort women to hear that. Like anytime I've tried to comfort the person I'm with, nothing I say really has ever helped, honestly. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, it's close to impossible to understand what's going on. Well, and, and, and this goes back to, I know it's too deep without like a lot of time to explain it, but at mm. the core of my program for men is you have to heal yourself and derive your self-worth 
from mm. inside authentically. Mm. When you do that, you're whole and you're healed and your brain can use medium brain energy and you feel good and your emotional correlates rise to the emotional correlate of love and peace and you're giving off positive juju. Right. Your partner has to do the same. And actually, I told Jamie this yesterday, when partners call, because partners call us too, we have a partners program. It's called Sanity After Betrayal. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying you as a porn user is a betrayer, but it's called betrayal trauma. What a person experiences when they find out that their partner has been using porn for mm -hmm. 20 years, that their partner has been with other people, that your, their partner lusts after other people. Mm -hmm. The brain shifts into this low power pattern of betrayal. But here's the point without waxing and waning, your partner also has to derive her own self-worth from inside. So the partner's journey isn't making you get into a program. She literally can't do that. We've already said that you have to commit hundred percent for your own reasons for you. And then she benefits from that. And if you keep using porn, she is going to experience collateral damage. It's not you doing it to her, but it's impacting her because of that collateral damage. But the best way for her to help you and herself is to derive her own self-worth from herself. Not an easy thing for most people. That's why both the programs, you have to derive your own self-worth because then you can come back to a relationship in an interdependent way. But it's absolutely imperative that you leave porn behind because if not, it keeps distorting the relationship and you can never get back to this place where you're two whole healthy people who can meet side by side and walk the journey of life side by side. Right. Well, and let, and let me tell, you know, the dudes. So, you know, I was, I was a virgin until I got married and I got married at 29. And so mentally I wasn't cause I had wrecked my brain. And so, you know, mentally I was definitely not, not right. that physically, but physically, physically yeah. I was and sex when you are having sex that is devoid of pornography and Porn, pornographic images is much more satisfying, much more pleasurable. And there, there are times where it can be even more intense in a good way. And you can actually connect with another human being. And I never really understood that until I actually had sex for the first time. I was like, oh, there's this thing. Like I felt like this connection with this person. And I never felt that because it was always one-sided for me. That was my experience with sex was one-sided. And, you know, a lot of the desires I had from watching pornography as I got away from it, a lot of the more twisted tastes began to kind of fall away slowly, you know, and I had less interest in some of the more extreme versions of things I saw, which I thought when I get married, I was like, oh, I want to do these certain things. It's like, <laughs> No, dude, like, which by the way, person. no healthy woman, the science shows no healthy woman actually wants the things that most men are consuming and want right. to try. Why and would they? even the, even the low grade stuff. Yeah. Why would they? You know, exactly. Cause most of it is, uh, someone said it to me last week. They're like, you know, can't I have 99% of this lovey dovey stuff with 1% slapping? I'm like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm like, maybe slapping, maybe, cause maybe you could you know, if your partner's into it, because, you know, I think, but the whole point was like, can I, can I like buy into this like healthy sexuality, but keep the door back door open to the, you know, 1% of the stuff I've been consuming. And, you know, I do tell people if they develop, like some people develop really extreme fetishes that it's really hard for them to stop thinking about if they've oh, been, they've coupled yeah. their brain to that for the last, you know, yeah. Porn was free on the internet in 2006. That's a long time for a lot of people, you know, so, yeah. um, if it can be incorporated into the healthy sex garden, a lot of couples can do that. And so right. it's not like, I'm not saying you can't do any of these things, but at the same time, a lot of what in, you know, men envision because of what they consumed in porn is, you know, scientifically and anecdotally, not what a woman's looking forward to in the bedroom. Actually, this guy who heckles me on YouTube, if you're listening, yep, it's heckling. Um, <laughs> his name's John which I actually enjoy some of the intellectual part of his banter, but some of it devolves. Um, but he wrote, he's like, all right, yada, yada, yada with all your healthy sex stuff. What does that actually look like? Actually look like in the bedroom. Two people are ready to do this thing. What does it look like? And I thought I wrote, this is a really good point. I'm going to make a video on it. And I will make a video on what is exactly, but like, there's no script to it. 
Right. You know, the, it's like you have to have communication and right. you have to be able to go, this is what I like. But if you're watching porn and you do, this is what, you know, to expand on your point, you don't know what you actually like because mm. it's so distorted by right. whatever thing that you've escalated into watching and your brain really is linked to it in a neurochemical way. And you have to stay out of it for a while to be able to go, okay, maybe this is authentic, you know? Right. And, you know, back to your point on when you can do that, when you unwire your porn brain and you rewire your brain for healthy sexuality, especially when you can communicate with your partner, what you create is the perfect neurochemical cocktail. And of course there's more, but I always talk about it as lower levels of dopamine. Dopamine isn't hijacking the whole experience and making it a performance like porn, lower levels of dopamine, which your brain will have to get used to serotonin and oxytocin. So it becomes an experience that can take you to a new realm in a different way. And most men who watch porn their whole life don't even know what that is. And they can't until porn's out of the mix. Right. It's so something I learned about sex that no one told me that I was like, wait, what? It is sex can be playful and funny Mm -hmm. and things that may have, if you're with a person, I, I, you know, in, in my life, it was my wife where something that may have once been embarrassing, if this is a random person you don't know, ends up just being funny. Or <laughs> you're like laughing and, and stuff that's like not considered sexual. It's not erotic, right? Mm-hmm. But it becomes part of sex. And like, no one told me that. No one told mm-hmm. me that like, oh, we could just have fun. Like it doesn't have to be erotic every time because that's what pornography is. It's erotic every time. And so you actually get an opportunity to connect with someone that you care about and they care about you. And so embarrassment goes out the window, shame goes out the window. You feel the freedom to talk about, I, I kind of want to do this thing. Is that all right? And they're like, Hey, you know, because I love you and I care about you, I'm willing to try that thing. And so, but a lot of the stuff that was twisted that I had in my head just, it melted away. I didn't have to like force it out. It just kind of naturally happened as I got away from pornography and got further and further away from it. Beautiful. Hopefully that was vague enough. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, totally. It's absolutely. Uh, Well, I think we'll wrap up on that. So let's put a bow on it though, is that, you know, if, and if you have a bow to add to it, you know, what I like to have people just bring the concepts together and what an Mm. action step is when even in the podcast. So if you listen to what I was talking about in terms of problematic porn use, if you're spending your time, energy, and money, if you are lying about it, even if you're lying to yourself about the amount of time that you're consuming pornography or its impact on you, if you, you know, continually keep going back for more, think about this because this is from a test, the problematic porn use scale. And if you answered one of them, you likely are being sucked into this. And the next thing I want you to know is this is insidious, meaning it's sleuthy. It happens under the surface and it's happening to you, even though you might not understand. It can only be a downward spiral. And, you know, an action step is recognizing this and committing to it and getting the right help. And that's why we're here because we have the right strategies and the right support. That's what science shows that you need and understand that your brain's being hijacked by it. So the signs are there, but it's not always easy to see them when you're in it. And that's why when you tell somebody else what's going on, especially an emotionally mature person who's prepared and knows what to look for, then they can reflect that back to you and go, you know, that sounds like you have a problem with this and we need to get you moving in the right direction. Right, that's so good. Just for my own little bow, if you watch porn, the studies are showing at a minimum of once a month, it will decrease your attraction to the person that you're with once a month. That doesn't seem like a lot, especially to a dude that I was watching it two or three times a day. I'm like, once a month, once a month is doing great. (laughs) Even that, even that is catastrophic to the person that you're with. And And you, and you, because you're not going to enjoy them, you know, so it's right, right, right. So get away from it. Seriously, get away from it and begin trying to connect with the person that you're with. And if you're not with somebody, get away from it so that you don't have to work on it when you find a person that you're with. Because to an extent, I had to do that. Yeah. I had to work through it and that caused a lot of harm. Right. So do it while you're single. Right. 
don't don't yeah, worry. totally Do get now. the energy get your energy you know that's what i tell people invest in yourself man when you invest mm -hmm. in yourself it's the best investment you could ever make. And I know it's hard for people to do that, but it will, it's an investment. And when you invest wisely, you get your investment back twofold, threefold, tenfold. So absolutely time, energy, and money, you know, spend it on yourself, not on stuff that's bad for your brain. Right. All right. Uh, thank you again for joining me. And sure, um, until next time. All right. Thanks, Zach. Bye.